Good morning, and welcome to our final presentation in our Aging at Altitude series. We've all learned so much from our marvelous presenters uh, and your great questions throughout the last couple of weeks. Today's topic is healthy aging through exercise, nutrition, and wellness visits. My name is Al Manzi. I'm president and CEO for Prairie Mountain Media and publisher for the Times Call and the Daily Camera. Our presenter today is Dr. Todd Wisser, He's DO and internist, senior medical director with New West Physicians. Following today's presentations, I'll moderate, as I always do, a question and answer session. And as always, please feel free to enter your questions at any time during the Q&A, into the Q&A or chat feature uh, on your device. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Todd Wisser. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me as Al uh, so nicely introduced me. Uh, my name is Dr. Todd Wisser. I'm an internal medicine physician with New West Physicians here in Colorado and Denver specifically. I work up in Evergreen um, and we are going to be talking about healthy aging through exercise, nutrition and wellness visits. So thank you very much. And we've uh, got a lovely day as I look out my window here um, to discuss these wonderful topics. And we're going to be talking a lot about movement and getting out and enjoying our world and our bodies. So without further ado, let's move forward. Let's see if I share my screen. That's our next step, I believe. Bear with me, I'm still kind of new to this. I typically do a lot of just clinical medicine. So all this fancy tech is not where I reside typically. There we go. <clears throat> and Al, will you uh, let me know where we are? Does that look good? It does look good. Um, your first slide is there, healthy aging through exercise, nutrition, and wellness visits. Perfect. Thank you. So um, first step in... And are you guys able to see me as well while I'm talking or is it just my slide deck for my own? We, we can see you as well. Okay, perfect. So I like this slide. Uh, this is kind of a wonderful uh, little phrase that resonates with me. Um, I'm an osteopathic physician. We'll talk about that in just a second. I went to Michigan State University for medical school. Um, they have both an MD and a DO program, um, but an osteopathic physician by trade is a bit more holistic. Um, that's sort of our niche. We look at kind of mind, body, spirit, um, your environment, your nutrition. We just kind of, the, the idea is that we take a broader picture of who you are as a person and as a patient. So this little phrase of dying as young, as late as possible really resonates with me. It kind of touches on um, quality of life as well as quantity of life, both being important. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. <clears throat> um, so just a quick little bit, I've, I'm married, I have three children, live up in Evergreen, as I stated, work with New West Physicians, we're a um, 25 practice um, wide primary care group here in Denver. Um, we also have specialists that work with us as well, and we'll talk a little bit more about that practice in just a second, but. Um, I used to be a high school chemistry teacher, actually, before medicine, um, taught high school chemistry for, <clears throat> excuse me, for about five years. Um, I think they were trying to kick me out after uh, setting fire to my classroom at one point in time. But uh, anyway, I left teaching after I really fell in love with science. So um, went back to wanted to apply what I was teaching and uh, went back to school, went to medical school, as I stated, at Michigan State University. Uh, I had my uh, first two children during medical school. Um, and then graduated and did a residency at Sparrow Hospital in Michigan State University as, a, as an affiliate. Um, and as I kind of stated, I chose osteopathic medicine versus allopathic medicine um, just for its more sort of holistic approach. Um, not that allopathy doesn't provide that, but uh, osteopathy, that's kind of what our focus was. And that's sort of what our um, whole kind of standard is based around is again, looking at our patient as a whole person who they are, what their psyche is doing, how they move physically, what they eat. Um, and the idea is around supporting the body through exercise and healthy living to really optimize the body's natural tendency towards health. So we're here as physicians, as patients, as people to just basically help our bodies be the healthiest they can and just understand that they do that pretty darn well if we just allow them to do so and provide the proper supports. Um, 
I feel qualified to discuss today's topic, not only because I'm a physician, um, but more importantly, as I'm a lifelong athlete and um, nutrition uh, based um, sort of human as well. I follow, I certainly try to practice what I preach. I always find uh, hypocrisy, hypocrisy to be a challenge when I'm on the receiving end of that. So I certainly try to practice what I preach and, you know, take away and benefit from doing what I, what I recommend. Um, so I was also a high school cross country coach and a varsity track and field uh, coach for about five years during my teaching as well. So athletics and movement and exercise, again, are just hugely part of just kind of who I am and what my family does um, and what I love and value and find important. Real quick, uh, New West Physicians, like I said, is a large primary care group here in Denver. I moved from Michigan, as I stated, I did my schooling at Michigan State University, moved out to Denver about five years ago um, and settled on, um, or not settled, but gosh, uh, sought out New West Physicians uh, for our approach to healthcare for our patients. We provide wonderful care. It's coordinated, it's personalized. We have hospitalists, we have specialists, we have diabetic educators, we have dietitians, nutritionists. We have a very broad spectrum of support for our patients um, that really allows us to, as clinicians, provide the best, best care for our patients, um, either in the hospitals, in the community, um, wherever it may be. So I love the multifaceted approach that we have and, and can give to our patients. So I put my favorite quote up there again, die young as late as possible, just because I love it. Um, and again, it's about quality and quantity, um, but really enjoying the time that we have here on, uh, on earth and our time uh, in this world. So <clears throat> there's another quote I love below it, and it's, and I'm going to read it. Um, I don't usually verbatim read from my slides, but here it goes. So life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. So I love that. It's about seizing the day, carpe diem, um, just really enjoying life and soaking it up and enjoying every day that we get because it's a blessing. And also what we're gonna talk about today is supporting your body and making the appropriate healthy decisions to allow you to really capitalize kind of on that quote here. So how do we make it happen? How do we live life full, to the fullest? How do we slide into the grave after uh, being all beat up and worn out and having lived life to its fullest? Well, the three biggies on my agenda here today are exercise, nutrition, and having a good rapport and establishing a relationship with your physician. This finally looks like the weather we're now appreciating as opposed to five to eight inches of snow. So this is good. <clears throat> Why is it important to keep exercising as you age? So we're going to kind of touch on those three little circles that we just showed, but our first one is going to be on exercise, and that's really going to be our large focus today. Um, we'll have some time at the end of this for question and answers, and we can delve more into the uh, nutrition and wellness visits with your primary care doc. But again, really, exercising is going to be my focus today, just because that's really, you know, the the... I get a lot of patients who ask me, hey, doc, you know, it's a, I'm here for my annual wellness visit, and I just wish I had a pill that could make my life better. Um, what is that pill or what is the pill to keep me from aging? What's, what's the magic fountain that I can drink from? Well, honestly, it's exercise. Um, there's an interesting book one of my patients told me about. I personally haven't read it and this is not a, um, this, is, uh, this isn't in support of it, but it was interesting and at least uh, piqued my curiosity and it was younger by next year. So I really like that idea and exercise is the way to get there. So why is it important to keep exercising as you age? All those reasons I've listed here, but balance, muscle strength, skeletal strength, cardiovascular health, and flexibility. Those are the big things that really can be gained from exercise. And as you can see, those are obviously, those are kind of the core to everything we do and our quality of life. Oh, you know what I didn't include? And I apologize, I meant to. Uh, cognition, our thinking should also be included in there. So um, again, rounding out that whole kind of our milieu of what we are as, as uh, organisms is also our cognition and our thinking. And that's also gonna be hugely impacted by exercise and we'll talk about that. Um, so balance, key to everyday movement. Um, interestingly, as we fall and I talk about this and this is gonna be included in part of our, the importance of really establishing wellness visits with your uh, physician yearly uh, for an annual physical or wellness, whatever you like to call it, <coughs> excuse me, um, is 
we always assess for falls. As people age, we're at risk for falls. As you can see here, one in five falls causes serious injury. Falls increase as we age. 25% um, of older Americans fall each year. And falls are the leading cause of both fatal and non-fatal injuries for people greater than age 65. So greater than age 60, 65, we begin to lose some of that um, balance. Our nerves aren't maybe what they used to be. And if you think about your nerves from your brain all the way down to your feet, that little balance, that proprioception, that feedback from the ground to your brain to tell you where you are in space, that diminishes over time. Just like our skin thins, our nerves also kind of begin to de degenerate over time too. So um, just knowing that um, we can't stop that per se, but we can absolutely help our brain to kind of reestablish how it balances itself as far as the body goes. And exercise helps you continue to do that. So your brain is continually learning um, based on kind of the new inputs or the lack of input that it's getting as it ages. So again, exercise, hugely important. So common myths, if I limit my activity, I'm not gonna fall. False, that actually that attitude actually increases risk for falls. So what we see is people who don't do anything, who are, aren't, who are not out exercising, um, who aren't walking, who aren't really kind of, again, keeping the brain fresh as far as its ability to learn with the new inputs that it's getting as we age. Um, people will go out and try to do something having not kind of prepared for that. And that's really when they're at risk for falls. So having a regular exercise routine really decreases risk for falls hugely. Um, key to preventing falls is increasing one's strength, flexibility, and balance. We're talking about the balance portion. We'll talk about the others in a second. And if I stay home, I will be safer. Hugely false. Get out, move around, do stuff. Over half of the falls uh, that we see occur at home. Um, so getting out and about is safe and, again, keeps you and decreases the risk for falls at home. The other side of this is falls do occur at home. So looking around critically at your environment. What's the lighting look like? Where are your carpets? Carpets we see a lot of times are often, often culprits for, um, for falls. They're, the little ends are curled up. I'm just thinking about my carpet. Um, and so the ends are curled up. So just really assessing your home, making sure you've got good lighting. Throw rugs aren't curled up and gonna trip over you. You know where your stairs are, put lights in, uh, make sure the bathrooms are safe, et cetera. So ideas to improve balance. Um, Exercises can be done every day and many days as you like. You know, this isn't one of the things where kind of, you know, if you're going to embark on a running routine, you might only want to limit it to three days a week or something so you don't injure yourself. Balance is different. Balance you can practice all the time. Um, I'm sitting here standing on one foot right now. You can't see that. Uh, but balance can be practiced anytime. That's what's wonderful about it. Um, I have to laugh. My brother and I, um, my grandfather was, a, was an old cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, and he would, when he would brush his teeth, he would stand on one foot. My brother and I would always think that was funny. We traveled with him quite a bit and we'd always walk by the bathroom. We'd share hotel rooms and things. And we'd walk by the bathroom and there's, you know, 75 year old uh, grandpa just standing on his foot, um, brushing his teeth and then he'd switch over when he was flossing his teeth. So uh, we always laughed about that. Then finally, one day we were like, you know, grandpa, what the heck are you doing? Um, and then he explained, he's exactly, I work on my balance. Um, he stands on his feet at the surgery table. Uh, like I said, he was a surgeon and he, don't worry, he didn't practice his balance while he was doing his surgery. Uh, but he did say it helped him maintain his balance throughout long surgeries and things when he was using both of his feet. So again, you can incorporate balance training kind of any time. Um, other ways to kind of improve things and kind of incorporate it. And we'll talk about these quite a bit. You'll hear them, hear me say these, but wonderful ideas for just kind of overall exercise. Tai Chi, yoga, walking on a trail versus maybe a paved road or a sidewalk, um, and then cardiovascular training as well. So all of that is going to make the brain have to work and, and uh, kind of inclusively incorporate balance training as well. So balance work can be done anytime. <clears throat> and kind of some simple ideas for balance exercises. So walking heel to toe for 20 steps. And we'll kind of go through, and again, you, but you can do these anywhere. That's what I like about the balance, like I said. Um, and you can make it your own, be creative. Um, so just ideas for some simple ones are walking heel to toe for 20 steps. Steady yourself with a wall if you need to. I mean, you can do this right down the house while you're walking to the kitchen if you need to, um, or going up the stairs, whatever it is. If you challenge yourself, your brain learns and it becomes easier and easier. So walk normally in as straight a line as you can. Uh, see how long you can stand on one foot. Uh, try holding this for 10 seconds on each side and then kind of work up if that becomes easy, work up to 20 seconds. You can do this while you're standing in line at the grocery store. 
Um, if, you stand, if you find standing on one foot is hard to do at first, try this. So hold on to a wall or a sturdy chair with both hands to kind of support yourself and kind of gradually improve um, or kind of continue to challenge yourself. So if that becomes easy holding onto the chair, then let go of the chair and maybe hold on with just a finger. Then kind of move to steadying your feet with no support at all. So again, make it a progression and we'll talk about kind of how we get into exercise safely if we haven't been doing as much of it. So muscular and skeletal strength. So as we age, your body naturally loses lean body mass. I think everybody knows that. Interestingly, uh, males, and I, it's probably around the same time for me, for females too, but I can just, I'm just thinking of the male statistic. But after the age of 35, males muscle mass just continues to decline gradually throughout life unless you do something. Obviously, if you get into strength training and things, you're going to bulk things up a little bit, add some muscle mass. But the tendency is we start to lose muscle after the age of 35, it gradually ticks down. So if we don't keep that lean body mass up and keep strong, um, it can keep you from partaking in activities that you enjoy. Um, and we need strength training to keep muscles strong. It's funny, if you talk to different groups of athletes and here in Colorado, we have lots of those, which is wonderful. We live in a wonderfully optimistic um, exercise enthusiast kind of community, which is great um, for everybody that sort of becomes contagious and makes people want to exercise more, which is wonderful. Um, uh, but what you find is, <clears throat> for example, runners, I myself, like I said, I used to coach cross country and track and field. Runners don't like to lift weights. Weightlifters don't like to run. Bicyclists, I find they're usually in the middle and willing to do both. But really, we need a combination of all of these things. Um, so strength training and cardiovascular training. But I would argue even more is really the skeletal muscle strength that I see people kind of hedging on and not doing as much as we age. And this is really important for decreasing risk for injury. We talked about falls. Um, <clears throat> those go up as we age and especially beyond age 65. If you do fall, if you're out skiing, you get knocked over by somebody, um, which I just had the other day in the office, the patient, he was 75 years old, was blindsided, hit by, by a skier. He was fine. He was a very healthy individual, fortunately. He did a lot of strength training. So you're going to have cushion. You're going to be able to respond to those accidents, which are going to occur. So protecting yourself by building the muscles around the joints and the bones is a great way to do this. The other side of that is comfort. You're going to be more comfortable. Joint pain decreases. You offload the pressure on the joints, the knees, the shoulders. If you strength train around the shoulders and the knees, it's amazing how that, what the muscles do for the joint and actually offload some of that, uh, that weight that those joints have to bear. Increased mobility. Um, again, and we'll talk more about flexibility moving forward. Um, and increased bone density, hugely important for females, but also for males. Um, again, decreasing that risk for fractures when we fall, which we all know as we age, a hip fracture can, can be terminal uh, for some people, unfortunately. So um, really increasing the bone density is important as well. And strength training is the only way to do that as well as nutrition. And we'll talk about that. Um, goal is kind of two days per week and really try to hit kind of the major muscle groups. So squats, core strengthening, um, doing lunges, kind of hiking up a mountain, all those things are really going to incorporate our big muscles. And then also doing kind of the chest and the shoulders and things. Those are our kind of biggest muscle groups Our, you know, our, our, our quadriceps, our glutes, our butt, our shoulders, our core. Those are kind of the biggies that we're looking for. Um, so how do we do that? Well, in incorporating muscular strength, and there's a, again, kind of like balance training, you can do a lot of this in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, choose to maybe work in your garden, wash the car by hand, go outside, you know, up here, I live up in Evergreen. <clears throat> um, I have a lot of patients who chop their own wood. I had literally an 89 year old gentleman who was out chopping wood um, in my office two days ago. And I was just astounded. The guy was amazing. Um, obviously we checked to make sure his balance was good and he was doing it safely, but yeah, he was out there chopping the wood, doing the, I mean, you can, you can Google, um, wood chopper exercises to do in a gym, but he was literally doing it the real deal. So, um, so incorporating that sort of thing into your just routine, um, that can be part of muscle strengthening. It doesn't mean you have to go to the gym. Um, but I do like the idea of doing sit-ups or push-ups in front of the TV. If you're someone who likes TV and maybe hasn't had a regular exercise routine, you know, during the commercials or something, just get up and do some sit-ups, do some push-ups. Um, it's a fun idea. It works well. Um, 
hire a personal trainer at a gym or a mobile trainer. I love that they've kind of with COVID and things too here, they've actually sort of expanded what they're doing and offering. Um, so mobile trainers, they will have personal trainers that come to your home and provide the equipment. Um, and that provides some supervision. If you aren't one of the, if you aren't someone who's really stayed in shape and has been exercising, they're gonna come and make sure they get you set up safely um, for an exercise routine, they can answer questions. So I like that idea as well. Um, the other thing which is nice, and we offer this through our Medicare Advantage program with New West Physicians and uh, United Healthcare and United uh, Health Insurance is silver sneakers or other insurance covered fitness classes. Many of the Medicare Advantage plans offer those, um, or not offer them, but they will cover those kind of classes at a community rec center, which is wonderful. So up here in Evergreen, we have silver sneakers. A lot of my patients participate in that, and they kind of give you the whole spectrum of balance training to strength training. They do some cardiovascular work. So it's a really nice kind of um, all-inclusive sort of service. <clears throat> so cardiovascular health, um, you know, when we see this, we always just think of, because they've done so many studies and so much research for so long, we think of heart, we think of strokes when we hear cardiovascular heart, uh, cardiovascular health, right? Um, and that obviously hugely, it's been studied and I don't know, thousands of studies um, that yeah, obviously doing cardiovascular exercise decreases your risk of uh, heart disease and decreases your risk for strokes. Interestingly though, the other side of that, the new side of this kind of over the past few couple of years here is really that cardiovascular health hugely decreases the rates of dementia. Um, and that includes mild cognitive impairment, which is kind of the sort of the first stages of dementia, typically where we see just kind of small changes, but then that progresses to dementia and sometimes Alzheimer's. But all the research really is bearing out now that cardiovascular health not only decreases risk for stroke and heart attack, but hugely decreases our risk for dementia, which is uh, for me anyway, a very scary thing to think about um, and wonderful to find such benefits from something that we already know is wonderful. So to not include it to me is um, uh, we're just missing out on really optimizing what we can. So tips for cardiovascular health, you know, we've all heard this, but park farther away from the store, you know, take the stairs if you're in a building, um, just easy things and, and any little bit helps too. That's the other thing. Um, invite a friend for regular walks. We'll talk about kind of making things interesting. And if you like to do it, you're going to do it. If you don't like doing it, you're not going to be interested. So keep it fun. Have a friend that does it with you or a spouse or a partner um, that, that kind of takes something up uh, new with you. Um, I like there's a, there's a quote that says, if it ain't new, it's through. So keep it fun. Um, try something new like Pilates, Zumba, a walking club. It's a great way to be social too. And especially knock on wood as COVID is hopefully kind of improving, um, you know, we can get out more and people are just itching to be social and meet people. Um, so, you know, get into a club. Uh, we have a lot of trails up here in Evergreen. Um, and I see there's a, a senior group that actually meets right out in front of my house. I live over by the Three Sisters Park and they meet um, twice a week. And it's just kind of a smattering of people and it's different people each time, but they all go for a hike kind of around the trails for about an hour or so. It's lovely and a great way to, again, just kind of be social too, uh, which is important for our well-being. Um, and then again, find something you like to do so that you're motivated. Just get something that, you, that gets your heart pumping because that's what cardiovascular health is about, just making that heartbeat, sweating a little bit. Um, so important to do that for brain health, heart health, all of the above. <clears throat> so physical exercise and dementia, as I said, this is really the newest the newest area of science in regards to exercise is really the huge improvement in the impact we're finding on the delay of or even the improvement in dementia um, and Alzheimer's. And again, this is a very new area. So there's not a lot of studies to say, you know, if you do this amount of exercise, your dementia will decrease by this much. That just doesn't exist yet. But we are working on that. And everything is pointing in that direction that there certainly is a huge positive impact on risks of and treatments for dementia with exercise. So <clears throat> just kind of interesting, if you begin exercising in midlife, you make this routine, um, and we're kind of talking midlife, 40 to 60 years old or so, um, but exercising, and when we say exercise, we're looking at 20 to 30 minutes of elevated heart rate three to five times per week. And all the studies have kind of looked over a year, um, no shorter time than that, but at least doing that for about a year, and you're going to see reduction and improvement clinically, and uh, again, quality of life will go up. So pretty astounding when you look at this, the risk of reduction is 30% for dementia 
if we begin an exercise program midlife and stick with it, and then a 45% risk reduction for Alzheimer's. So that's astounding and hugely powerful. Um, exercising later, later in life, again, huge benefits still, maybe not quite as broad, but, but it's absolutely there and important to do. So there's a study of 760, uh, 716 people averaging around the age of 82, um, and people who were in the bottom 10% for exercise, so, her, so people who weren't moving much at all, the bottom of that 10%, they had two more, they were greater, they had greater than two times the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's versus the groups that were moving uh, more. So again, hugely important and huge impact. And I like the idea, we always think of mind over matter, right? Or you are what you think is something that I kind of quote to my patients too. But really interestingly, it goes the other way too. And that's what the research is showing is that strong body equals strong mind. So if you are exercising, strength training, cardiovascular health, your mind is going to be stronger. You're going to decrease that risk for cognitive impairment or MCI, mild cognitive impairment. Um, one in five people greater than 65 years old develop mild cognitive impairment. So again, this is a, um, it's a ubiquitous problem. It's everywhere. There's a recent, Scott, actually not recent, sorry, this is a 2012 study, but there was a Scottish trial, 638 people in Scotland, all over the age of 70. Um, they participated in one year of aerobic exercise. And interestingly, this had some huge physiologic um, changes. They were able to show, and they looked at the hippocampus, uh, which is the part of the brain that was uh, is used for memory. And after this year of aerobic exercise, the people who were doing aerobic exercise versus those who were not, the aerobic exercise people showed an increase in the hippocampus size equivalent to reversing one to two years of age-related shrinking. So <clears throat> again, pretty profound effects that we're seeing from exercise. This was interesting, just literally just popped up on my phone two days before this presentation. Um, on March 23rd, uh, 2020, uh, 2021 here, the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, and it was a study out of the University of Texas. Um, they had 70 patients of the ages of 55 to 80, all with some mild cognitive impairment. Again, sort of that initial first stages of, of cognitive changes leading to dementia and possibly Alzheimer's. Um, but they had two groups. One was simply stretching. The other was walking and cardiovascular. Um, and they were doing these stretching or cardiovascular training three to five times per week, again, 20 to 30 minutes. What they found was increased plasticity, meaning flexibility within the blood cells and the vasculature. And they also found increased blood flow to the brain within the group that exercised. So as far as all the ramifications and what comes of us, Again, it's still a new kind of area, but, but all very positive as far as what the results are showing here. I don't think I missed, okay. <clears throat> so let's move on to flexibility. <laughs> uh, so I say this too, as we, and I always just like to point this out, but as we age, you know, we all become a little less flexible, not only physically, but also in life. So don't forget, remain flexible as much as you can. Life is full of the only constant, right, is change. So. Flexibility is important, not only in life, but important physically as well. We're going to talk about the physical aspects of that today, but uh, part of a well-rounded physical training program is flexibility. I, I'll be honest, I have a love-hate relationship with, with flexibility. I am not very flexible, but I work at it, um, and it's important. It, it lowers the risk for injuries during any physical activity. If you're able to move and bend, if you fall, if you become off balance, if your joints are flexible, you're not going to tear things. Um, so again, hugely important to incorporate this. Also decreases joint pain and arthritic pain, just like the strength training does. Um, I like for me personally, the way I do my flexibility, because I do not like stretching. Again, I have a love-hate relationship is I incorporate that. I do some yoga. Um, I do some active kind of stretching when I'm getting ready to do my uh, strength routine and things like that. But yoga, Tai Chi, something uh, called bar or Pilates, these are excellent ideas to get some exercise and flexibility in there. They also aid balance as well. Um, again, they kind of go hand in hand. So making a commitment to exercise, try to make it part of each of your day. The, the actual guidelines would say you need 150 minutes ideally of exercise, um, of cardiovascular or strength training, just basically exercise that gets your heart pumping 150 minutes per week. So if you divide that up, that's 30 minutes, five times a week. Um, so where to begin, right? Start with a plan. And I always tell people, you know, start small, don't set unreasonable goals. If you're someone who hasn't been exercising 
um, and you think, oh my gosh, I got to get back into it. I want to decrease my risk for dementia and my risk of a heart attack and stroke and uh, my risk for falls, you know, everything we've talked about is start small. I always tell people, my patients start low, go slow. So don't jump back into, you know, I used to work out in the gym when I was 20 years old and I'm going to hit up the bench press and get back to it. And, you know, no, pump the brakes and uh, just back it up and start, start low, go slow. So maybe you start with like push-ups on your knees and then you progress to kind of a full push-up, but, but start easy. Don't hurt yourself. The worst thing you can do with exercise is you go gung-ho and then you either hurt yourself or you feel really, really sore and it's not funny. You don't want to do it anymore. So make it fun, make it reasonable, make it safe. Uh, select a program that you enjoy. It's important to find something like we said that you like. If you don't like going to the gym, don't buy a gym membership. Um, there's a lot of ways and that you can go outdoors and train. I'm sorry, I keep looking over here at the window, uh, but get outside. Um, do your strength training outdoors. Do sit-ups out in the park. That's personally what I do after I do my runs. Um, I don't like going to the gym. So <clears throat> there's a lot of ways to incorporate and make an exercise routine around what you like to do. Even if you like watching TV, you can get up at the commercials and do your sit-ups and push-ups. So there's no excuse. <clears throat> Schedule it. We found that people who actually put exercise on their calendar are far more apt to continue with that and do it. So really hold yourself accountable. I set my alarm at 4.30 in the morning, three days a week uh, to do my exercise before my children get up and before I have work. And that's the only way I get it done. So really making it a priority is important. Gear up, make sure you get good quality equipment, stuff that's going to keep you safe. Don't try to go out and start, you know, doing some good hike, you know, doing some good hikes and things like that in a pair of, uh, you know, flats or sandals or something. Go out and get some good quality shoes or good quality clothes that keep you cool. You're not going to overheat in, you're not going to twist your ankle on nice shoes, et cetera. Uh, vary your routine. Like I said, if it ain't new, it's through. So keep it fun. If you get bored with hiking, well, you know, do something else. Um, take up biking, kayaking, paddling. We live in a lovely state. So really outdoors is, is our gym here in Colorado. And we have a lot of options and you can do this at any age. Uh, work out with a friend. We find partners. Again, if you've got a partner who's involved, one, you're accountable to kind of show up for them. They're going to push you and vice versa. You can push them. Um, and if your goal is kind of weight loss, again, there's research to show that if a couple um, does this together, whether it's a, a friend and a friend or a spouse or a significant other, um, outcomes are much better. So pair up with somebody to, to do it. it, makes it more fun. Don't stop, keep going. That's the, that's the uh, what I've really learned interestingly from moving to Colorado because it's so much harder, I feel like to get in shape here than it was back in Michigan. The altitude obviously is hugely different, um, but for me, and we're all aging. Um, but for me, as I age, I've noticed, my God, it's so much harder to get back into it versus just continuing with it. So as much as you might say, eh, I'm just going to take the holidays off and not do anything, you know, really just do something. It doesn't take a lot to maintain what you've gained, but it takes a whole lot to just get back into it from square one from the ground level. So don't stop. Once you start a routine, just keep going and you will feel so much better too. Um, it's just amazing. And then obviously you're safer and decrease your risk for all the health stuff, but feeling uh, better is hugely important for us as humans. Um, and reward yourself when you make progress, set some goals. Um, for me, it's um, having a glass of wine at the end of the week. You know, I'm very good throughout the week. I don't do any of my drinking or anything like that, but hey, if I'm healthy, follow my diet, do my exercise, I enjoy two glasses of wine on my Friday nights, you know? And so find something you like. If you like an ice cream cone, I had a patient the other day, it was ice cream. That was his uh, that was his downfall. He said, he was doing it every night, two scoops. I'm like, Oh, good Lord. Um, we got to back off on that. So maybe you don't do it every night, but you do it once a week. Um, so do reward yourself though. That's important. <clears throat> and then the importance of nutrition. And like I said, this, our focus is kind of is more exercise today, but I'll gladly answer kind of nutrition questions here at the end too. Um, but we all are aware of this, that good nutrition reduces the risk of heart disease, diabetes, strokes, interestingly, some cancers as well, um, and hugely improves uh, the risk for osteoporosis, reduces high blood pressure and lowers cholesterol, and improves our well-being. That's the other thing, too. I find when I'm eating well, I feel better. You go out and have your uh, Five Guys hamburger or In-N-Out burger or whatever they are, and if I have one of those for lunch with fries versus 
a nice salad, you know, I'm far more alert. I feel better. I'm not bloated. I mean, so food really, you know, we kind of are what we eat. So, so choose healthfully um, and help your support your body in doing what it's trying to do, which is keep you healthy and stay healthy. Um, it also improves our ability to fight off illnesses and improve our ability to recover from illnesses and injuries. And then obviously weight loss is a big thing. Um, and weight loss plays a part. And so hand in hand, exercise and nutrition both go together, obviously. Um, but again, doing, doing both versus just one or the other, we really have a nice synergistic effect too, which is wonderful. And I find personally, <clears throat> I tell this to my patients is, you know, when I'm working out hard and I've scheduled that exercise and I get up to do it, I devoted a lot of energy into doing that. And it was hard and I didn't want to get up, but man, once I got up, I felt good, but that's going to translate into, you know, I put in all, I invested all this effort and energy. I'm not going to ruin it by eating something crummy. So for me, when I'm exercising, my diet improves significantly too. And it's really interesting. I've talked to a lot of patients who feel kind of the same way. Um, so tips to eating well, lots of fruits and vegetables. If you're going to do carbohydrates, really lower the amount of carbs. But if you're going to eat carbs, uh, go for the whole grains. So I love um, muesli cereal, granolas, whole wheat breads. Um, I'm not a big fan of pasta. Those are pretty simple carbs, but if you're going to do pasta, I'm Italian, so that kills me to say that. Uh, but if you're going to do pasta, make sure it's a whole wheat pasta. Um, and low fat, fat-free milk, um, lean meats, and then try other sources of protein too. Um, you know, poultry, fish, beans, tofu, um, all kind of fun options. So keep it creative, make it fun. And tips for cutting back on sugar. This is our biggest downfall in our society is sugar. Um, you know, obesity is an epidemic at this point. Um, fortunately, again, we live in Colorado in a healthy state, uh, but we still have to battle with uh, being overweight, being obese. Um, and he, those are all factors for dementia and diabetes and heart disease, et cetera. I mean, we know all of that. So a real big thing is cutting back on the simple sugars. So kind of start small first, you know, decrease the amount of sugar you're adding to your coffee each day. The other thing I find oftentimes people really don't realize is um, don't drink your calories. Uh, fruit drinks, sodas, obviously we all know about, but um, alcohol, wine, beer, even whiskey, vodka, um, all those, you know, those all have a lot of calories. Um, so really curtailing those. So for my patients, especially during the pandemic, everyone seems to be drinking a little bit more. Um, but maybe you cut back from having beer on the weekdays and you just enjoy a beer or two, like I said, I do with my wine on the weekends. Um, and you will immediately find huge improvement in weight, I promise you, because it's all simple sugars that are included in those alcoholic beverages um, and other, again, fruity drinks. But I find alcohol kind of in our milieu of people we're discussing as far as demographics to be a, a, big, um, a big factor for that. Eat fresh fruit, avoid canned fruits. There's a lot of syrup and sugar in that. Um, flavored yogurt, go with the vanilla yogurt and just kind of add your own fresh fruit on top of it instead of all the high fructose corn syrup that they include with the uh, yogurt to try to make it taste better. Um, add fruit um, instead of sugar. Actually, I did that this morning. I'm honest, I'll be um, I'm guilty of that, but I do a cup of steel cut oats and I throw instead of brown sugar, which my kids love, they get that, but I just throw on fresh fruit um, and that gives it plenty of sweetness. So um, cut the servings back to my Lord, right? America, we have the craziest, biggest serving platters. I have a picture of my son. I just looked at it this morning. We were going through pictures of him at a uh, Mexican restaurant just down the hill in Golden and the plate literally like bigger than his head. And he was kind of looking at like, oh my Lord, I told him that you don't have to eat it, buddy. It's all good. Uh, but you know, cut it back when you're full, stop eating. You don't have to finish everything on your plate, save it for lunch. Watch out for the hidden sugars as well. You know, read the label, read the labels. Shop on the outside of the grocery store as well. Down the middle aisles is bad. There's a lot of additives and sugars and things like that in those middle aisles. So really staying around the outside with the fresh food is better. Um, replace sugar completely. So use cinnamon instead of sugar, use spices. Um, switch out sugar for unsweetened applesauces and recipes. I'm not a huge cook personally. I've, I've never done this, but I know I have people who would use applesauce instead of sugar or butter and things like that. And they have cookies and whatnot taste pretty darn good. So something to think about. Um, and then sweeteners. I prefer the kind of plant-based sweeteners such as stevia versus the more refined kind of uh, chemically derived sweeteners. Um, but either way, using those over uh, regular sugar and fructose is better.
and then partnering with your physician. So really seeing your primary care physician once a year is hugely important. I'm not putting that out just because I have three kids who need to go through college and I'm a primary care physician. <clears throat> um, but there's a lot of literature to say annual wellness visits are important. You talk to any college of cardiology, college of gastroenterology, college of urology, whatever the specialty is, there are screening guidelines for cancers and things within those specialties, right? So colorectal cancer, uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer, et cetera. We screen for those things during your annual wellness visit. And we talk about those screenings and the importance of those. So establishing a strong rapport with your primary care physician and seeing them at minimum once a year is hugely important. At those times we do, as well as cancer screenings, we're doing lab work, looking to make sure hemoglobin and white blood cells and your electrolytes and your thyroid, everything's working well. So we do those labs. Make sure you're up to date with your vaccines. Make sure you don't have high blood pressure, the silent killer. Um, so vital signs, we look at those. And then the other side of the thing that's important too and doesn't get discussed in this uh, topic for another day, but is advanced directives. So those are all things that we touch on annually at a wellness visit. So important to do those things. Um, and what's nice too um, is we are now doing a lot more, um, we have a lot more technology at our disposal for helping our patients and patients uh, helping you to get in to see us. Um, virtual visits, right? We do just like this, a lot of um, Zoom visits with patients um, using a uh, HIPAA approved uh, platform that's obviously um, meet standards for uh, privacy and whatnot. So they're very safe. They work wonderfully. I saw a patient the other day in, uh, where was it? He was down in Amsterdam. And then I saw another patient in Hawaii. Uh, so it's really nice. You can get a hold of your primary care doc. Both of these patients just had sinus infections and I was able to treat them overseas um, from Colorado. It was wonderful. So, so COVID has given us that, which is one of the only good things that's come out of that. Um, and then a lot of technology is kind of fun. If you're a technology person, right? The Apple Watch has EKGs that you can monitor, heart rates, oxygen levels. So there's a lot of fun kind of tech out there too uh, to be utilized as far as wellness goes. Um, and carpe diem, right? Seize the day. I'm a big advocate for, you know, if you don't like the way things are going, change it. Don't wait for a time to change, do it now. There is no time, but the, there's no better time than the present, right? To actually make a change. And as we get into nicer weather, hallelujah. Um, but you know, it's a great time to kind of get outdoors, take up some exercise if you're not doing it, switch your exercise routine up, um, but make it fun, but do it now. Just don't wait. You don't need to have New Year's come around. We saw what happened when 2021 came around. We thought it was gonna be better. Yeah, that didn't work out. So. Um, and actually maybe 2020 was worse, but either way, don't wait for the new year, do it now. Um, and what I always tell my patients and, and me personally too, is just, you know, what do you, what are your goals? So some people for everybody, goals are going to be different and motivations are going to be different. So picture yourself in a year. What is it that you want to be doing? If you were to make the changes, what would it be that you like? I do this with smoking as well, or tobacco use. Where would you be in a year if you could just stop the smoking or start exercising? What would you be able to do? How would you feel better? Um, you know, you're going to be able to move better. Do you want to be able to lift your grandchildren up? Do you want to be able to hike up a 14er? I had a, uh, I love this state. I had an 86 year old male who came in and was telling me this year for his physical that he had climbed Mount Beerstad. He almost made it at, for his 85th birthday. There's actually a TV thing about a little, I think Fox News or something did something, but he climbed almost, he was 500 feet short of the top, I think, but he climbed Mount Beerstad. That was his goal for you. He, so he exercised for a year to do this at age 85. So there is no reason that any of us can't do something and pick a goal, pick a mo something that motivates you. So, you know, is it feeling better? Is it improving your mood? Is it decreasing anxiety? Um, you know, we didn't touch on this and I won't get into it, but um, exercise is the best thing to do, the best thing to treat depression and anxiety as well. Um, so include that too. Um, you know, is it a swimsuit that you want to fit into? Um, is it hiking with the grandkids? Do you want to improve your labs and make your cholesterol look better on paper? Do you want your bone density scores to go up? Um, enter a race, but have something that really pushes you. Um, and it doesn't have to be overwhelming to make a positive change. Like we said, just kind of, you know, start just walking, start moving, go outdoors. You don't have to go to a gym to do this, but just pick up little things along the way and just make sure you kind of keep at it and keep progressing. 
So that's kind of the end of our talk here. I just want to take a moment just to say thank you to our co-sponsor. Not only was this put on uh, by Optum and New West Physicians, but Mary Hansen, who is a broker in our community, also helped kind of uh, facilitate this. So we want to, uh, I just want to extend my thanks to Mary and say thank you so much. <clears throat> and if you're looking for a broker, she's an excellent one. Um, and uh, she can answer all your questions in regards to Medicare, Medicare Advantage. That is an entirely different side of medicine that I was not trained in and they didn't teach us in medical school. Um, and that's why we have people like Mary and brokers that are amazing and can navigate those waters. So please do reach out to Mary if you have questions at all. She's wonderful. And then I think, do we have some time for questions? I'm a, like I said, I used to be a teacher, so I usually am long-winded, but I think I actually did okay. Uh, you did great. You, you did great. You're right on time. Uh, very, very uh, uh, positive and uplifting messaging uh, on exercise and wellness and diet. Um, uh, really was uh, terrific to listen to. Um, I've got I've got some questions for you as we wait for some questions to come in from our from our audience. Um, uh, you didn't you didn't hit on supplements, but I know a lot of people today are taking things like fish oil and coq tens and you know, vitamin D3s and, and, uh, and, and saw palmettos and things like that. So, so can you talk a little bit about the value of supplements in terms of also uh, being part of the, the, the exercise and nutrition uh, plan? Absolutely. Um, let's see, did I actually share any things? You did, you're good. <clears throat> Fantastic. It's been a successful day all around. Um, yeah, excellent questions, Al. I have, um, <clears throat> so I came from Michigan, like I said, Michigan people, and no offense to people from Michigan if they're on the line here, but I'm from there, so I can say this. Um, nobody took any supplements in Michigan. It was really interesting. Then I moved here, and and I'm going to pick on Boulder. Uh, I have friends up there, so I think I can do that too. But but I get the feel from Boulder. I get the evergreen clientele. Everyone comes in on 30 supplements. You know, they're eating, they're getting their calories from the supplements. Um, and honestly, and again, I'm an osteopathic physician. The body is an amazing organism. It lived long, healthy lives well before supplements. It doesn't need a lot of that stuff. Um, it just doesn't, you know, honestly, and, and you're going to hear different opinions on this. This is mine, um, again, secondary to my medical training, but I'm not a big believer in supplements. If you eat healthy diet, good fruits, vegetables, antioxidants, you're not taking in a lot of alcohol. You're treating your body with respect. Um, the only supplement you really need is vitamin D. We do not get enough vitamin D. We always, I hear, you know, everyone talks about in the, the, um, the illusion is, oh, we live in a sunny place. I live in Arizona and Colorado and yeah, you know, no, our skin just doesn't make enough vitamin D for us. So a vitamin D supplement, especially for females, but also for males, I take one myself. Um, you do need vitamin D about 2000 international units a day. Um, and before you start that, you know, any of the advice I'm giving you, you're not my patient. I don't know you. Uh, per se, but, you know, I would talk with your physician before beginning that. But um, from my experience, that's the only one you need. Some people might argue vitamin B12 as well, especially if you're a vegetarian, you might be a little bit low on that. If you're not eating meats, that's usually derived from meat. Um, but again, D is the only thing and then B12. And then again, exercise, eating well, um, staying hydrated, you're going to do fine. Your body's amazing. It will pull what it needs from uh, what you give it. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, oh, somebody just thank you for your presentation. Um, let's talk about, uh, I know, I know silver sneakers is very popular for people who are on Medicare. Uh, are there, are those things covered? Is silver sneakers programs covered by um, other insurances prior to becoming uh, uh, of the age to get Medicare? You know, that is to check with on. Um, everybody's is different. I know a lot of the Medicare Advantage plans do include those kind of supplemental exercise programs, um, uh, chiropractic visits, those kind of things. Um, so I'm mostly familiar with Medicare Advantage, um, but I don't believe those things can come from straight Medicare or from supplements. But again, that would be a question for Mary Hansen, who was a broker that we highlighted here. Uh, but those are excellent questions and a huge, um, a huge benefit from the Advantage plans. Uh, again, me knowing those and being familiar with those. Uh, but it's yeah. nice to have a lot of my patients that utilize it. It's great. 
Yeah, I think I think it's a fabulous program. Um, you know, people that are that are involved in it as well. Um, you know, if you're if you're on a, a medical pro program like Kaiser and a lot of these high uh, deductible programs, um, you know, the challenge of managed care where where they're they're attempting to cut costs, so they don't they you know they're they're reluctant to do testing, they're reluctant to add supplements, they're reluctant to add meds. Um, so as a as a um, uh, as a as a, as somebody, what would you say to somebody who is in that kind of program to make sure that they're doing everything they can do? Um, again, it's really just a matter of um, you know. I guess I, I, you know my training as an osteopath is we support the body in its natural state as much as possible, and if we feed it well, provide it the exercise it needs you know, psychologically be sound, do some mindfulness, meditation, you know, kind of whatever it is, but really approaching the holistic uh, kind of body in and of itself. I, with all my patients, and they know this is, we certainly try to manage things without medications and whatnot first. Um, and so I kind of, we always start there, right? Before we add blood pressure medications, before we go on statins, it's like, you know, let's work on weight loss. Let's get you moving. Let's try to change what you're eating. Um, so let's do that stuff first. And then again, have medications, certainly uh, osteopathic MDs, whatever, we're all trained exactly the same. So we have meds, we, I use them all the time. Um, but certainly at my approaches, let's do it in a kind of holistic fashion. First, we have the better chemistry through better living through chemistry if we need it. Um, but let's start the other way first. The other side of that is I have patients who come in asking for, you know, I want this test and this study and this and this, um, you know, the other side of things too, is there's a lot of evidence out there that says over testing can be equally as detrimental as under testing. You can over diagnose things. You can send people for tests and procedures that can be, you know, there's nothing safe in medicine. I tell that to everybody, whether it's imaging, whether it's medications, um, there's always a risk with everything we do in medicine. Um, so if you end up with a CT of the chest and all of a sudden they see a pulmonary nodule or something funky that may never have been become anything, you're all of a sudden chasing this little finding that you had going through a lot of tests, exposing yourself to radiation. Mm -hmm. um, so again, really talking with your physician, it's important to look at how much testing do I need? What is necessary and what is not necessary? And what does the evidence show? That's one thing I really like about New West um, is that we practice evidence-based medicine. We have something called optimal care, which is a bench to bedside program where we are able to take the sort of newest research that says, hey, you should or should not do this test um, because of this reason. And then we're able to apply it right in our clinical setting too. So, so I think that practice on evidence-based medicine is hugely important more and more, even with all the, the, the media that came out with the pandemic and whatnot, really having this ability to fall back on what science is and peer-reviewed evidence-based medicine is so important. So talking with, for, with your physician and trusting in them. You know, you go to them because we have knowledge. This is what we do. So trust what we're saying too. Um, and, and, I, and I'm not preaching that. I'm just saying, you know, it, it should be a good rapport with your doc. Um, but that's why, so, so to your question is, you know, do you need more tests? Do we need more meds? Do we need more, you know, it's a collaboration between your doc and the patient to really, really determine what's appropriate and necessary for that patient. Yeah, we actually have a question about, um, about taking calcium pills. Uh, um, uh, I'm assuming this is more for women than men, but but uh, but that's that's the question. <laughs> yeah, so it's a great question. Um, and there's been a lot of research around that actually. And again, I'm not your doctor, so I'm not going to tell you what to take. But I'll tell you what I tell my patients, which is you absolutely need vitamin D. We don't get that enough from the diet or from the sun. So everybody, males, females, need to be on vitamin D. Calcium is interesting. Too much calcium is actually a bad thing. It used to be thought exactly you do the vitamin D and the calcium for bone density, but really new findings are too much calcium actually increases risk for cardiovascular disease as well. Um, so really the goal for calcium, and oftentimes people, if you're eating cheese, green leafy vegetables, ice cream, yogurt, milk, you know, all those things have calcium. And there's a lot of things that are fortified with calcium nowadays too. Um, but if you're getting 1200 milligrams is kind of the magic number. Again, this is what I work with my patients on and you should talk with your physician about specific dosing, but 1200 milligrams a day, typically we get that from our diet. So a supplement of calcium isn't typically necessary, but talk that over with your doc uh, before you either start or do away with a calcium supplement. What about the difference between organic and non-organic? Boulder's really popular. You know, they have a lot of natural stores and and, uh, you 
know, everybody heavies up on the organics, which are significantly more expensive. Yeah. Um, what's your thought process and uh, what's your advice on organic versus non-organic? You know, that's an excellent question. Um, and, and you're going to get varied opinions on that. And if you talk to a natu naturopathic physician um, versus uh, myself as an osteopathic or an MD, you're going to hear varying responses. My, my approach, honestly, is I haven't seen any real significant literature to say, oh my, I mean, there's literature to say you should eat green leafy vegetables and fruit versus pizza, right? I mean, that exists. There's no literature to say organic versus inorganic is better or worse. <clears throat> they have not linked organic, organic foods with lower cancer risks. I have not seen that peer reviewed research. To me, the more important thing is eating those fruits and vegetables, whatever they may be. I would argue wash them when you get them home. Certainly there are gonna be pesticides and, and whatnot fertilizers on them. So certainly wash your fruits and vegetables, but again, organic versus integrated, I personally haven't seen any research to say one way or the other. And if cost is an issue, and you're trying to eat healthy, just buy whatever vegetables you can afford and wash them well. And I would do that with organics too. Um, but more important is just getting those fruits and vegetables, limiting the simple carbohydrates. Less important is where do those vegetables come from? Excellent. Well, I think we are uh, getting close to our to our deadline here and uh, we don't have any more questions in chat or in, or in uh, our Q&A uh, function. So I will just say to you, uh, Dr. Wisser, thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, just tremendously important and uh, vital information for, for everyone on the call. And uh, we appreciate it very much and we wish you good luck. And folks, thank you so much for attending all of our aging or as many as you attended of our Aging at Altitude uh, series. We'll be bringing it back as we always do. So we'll see you next time. Again, thank you everyone and have a great day. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you, Todd. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.